And now I give you one of the greatest speakers in the kingdom of God. Dr. John Causey, lead evangelist of Chicago and world sector leader of the PAC. World sector, let's give it up for our brother. Thank you, Please remain standing during the entire message. Good evening, family. I'm fired up tonight. I see that the Lord has already parted the Red Sea for us. Tell of my lesson is not by might. Not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's taken from Zechariah chapter 4. You don't have to turn there right now. We need this lesson because we need to understand that the question is not, is the spirit of God in you? The question is, is are you in God's spirit? Now, I've never had to do this before. Give you a spiritual sermon while you're also getting a physical food as well. And a lot of brothers have come up to me and said, you know, you've got the toughest speech of the entire conference. I'm like, really? Why is that, bro? He says, because the disciples love their chicken and their chicken nuggets. I said, well, I don't think they love their chicken and chicken nuggets more than they love their Lamb of God nuggets from the Holy Spirit. Let's give it up for our host, the mighty LA Church. You know, the LA disciples are amazing. They're so friendly, they're so warm. They greet you and they hug you so tight. But you know, they sometimes say stuff that just don't make sense. <laughs> One of the brothers came up and, and, and he hugged me and he said, John Causey, John. Why do y'all all say my first and last name? Cause somebody just called me John once in a while. <laughs> but you know, he wrapped, he wrapped his arms around me and he hugged me and he hugged me and he said, bro, are you here in town? I'm like, I, I, I think so. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little older, but I, I don't know. Am I, am I here? But I appreciated his greeting. You know, I'm very grateful for my amazing wife and my amazing family. My wife, Emma, tells me I wouldn't be half the man I am without her. And that's true. That's actually not true though, because she's my better half. And so I'm less than half the man I would be without you, honey. I love you. Thank you for being my best friend. You're amazing. I'm thankful for my kids, Taylor, Danny and Alicia and Jonathan and my grandson, Jackson, who was just born a little over five months ago. Jackson's already been on campus. I'm so grateful for my Fab Five. You said Fab Five? Yeah, I need, I need a lot of people to help me stay spiritual. I'm so thankful for my teacher, my mentor, my discipler. I've been following Kip for 40 years and I plan on following him for the next 40 years as well. Thank you, Kip and Elena. He's my team, my teacher. Tony Antolon is my team, my truth. I appreciate Tony so much. He always tells me the truth when I call him. Sometimes he calls me and tells me the truth. You say, why do you need a truth teller in your life? Because anything that you leave unattended in your life grows. And you need somebody in your life to tell you the truth, especially when it comes to sin. My transparency, Mike Kirstner, 
Mike keeps me open before God all the time. My translator, Tim Kernan, we talk about all kinds of kingdom stuff. He helps me translate things like, why am I preaching while people are eating? <laughs> my transcribers, my Pac-8 disciples, they're amazing. You know, sometimes I'm on the phone with them and they're quiet. You know, when somebody's quiet with you on the phone, you're thinking, do they have an attitude about what I'm saying? And then I go, bro, what's, what's the problem? He said, bro, we're taking notes. We want to write down every word you say. And I appreciate so much my, my transcribers. And then my amazing six men, my world sector leader brothers. Love you, brothers. Thank you for all you mean to me. And in the spirit of the crown of thorns, especially Michael Williamson. Can you guys take a challenge? Be careful tonight of banquet formality. I'm not trying to hear no opera claps tonight. No uppity amen, bro. I know you're on your dream date. I know you're with your dream wife and spouse. But y'all need to loosen up tonight. I want to hear some loud applauses. I want to hear some loud amens. We're going to be tested tonight. Can we eat food and can we eat the food of God and be fired up anyway? Be careful of your banquet formality. Brothers, just because you're on your dream date, say those loud amens. You know, I, I know some of you are a little awkward. Somebody's gonna knock over a glass of water tonight and it's gonna fall on someone. Go ahead and let your date know, this is me. I, I'm a little clumsy, this is me right here. Don't try to hide who you are. I'm gonna just share scriptures with you tonight. Please write them down for the sake of time. Second Corinthians chapter four, you will not have time to turn there. In verse seven, Paul describes, as we talk about the Holy Spirit tonight, Paul describes the Holy Spirit as a treasure in a jar of clay. I want you to know tonight, you are not the treasure. You are the jar. And a jar of clay, not a jar of Tiffany. A jar of clay, fragile, breakable. You're the container. But what's inside of you, the Holy Spirit, is treasure. Go ahead and tell the person next to you, that's me. I'm a jar of clay with treasure inside of me. It's important that we understand tonight, church, that the Holy Spirit is the greatest unused power in the world and in the church. It's not that it's unavailable, but that it's simply unused the way God would want it to be. You know, it's amazing. The American 911 emergency system is state of the art. If you have an emergency, all you need to do is pick up your phone and you dial 911. And you will almost instantly connect to a dispatcher. In front of the dispatcher is a readout. It lists your telephone number, your address, your name. The name in which the number is listed at that address. 
also listening in on that call, is the fire department, the police, the paramedics. And many at times are so upset by why they called the number that they can't even explain their problem. A loved one will dial concerning a spouse's heart attack or condition and they'll stutter and they won't be able to say anything. They'll just scream, help me. The dispatcher doesn't need you to know why you called. They don't need you to say anything. They already know where the call is coming from. In fact, they're already on their way to help you. You see, tonight, we need to understand that our 911 operator is the Holy Spirit of God. He's near, he's now, he hears, he helps, not because we're in crisis, but because we're Christians. He knows where you are. He knows where you aren't. He knows where you never need to go. He knows your name. He knows your needs. He's here tonight to rescue and revive you spiritually. You say, well, how do you know this? Well, it's confirmed over in Luke 911. Luke chapter 9, verse 1, sentence 1. Luke 9, verse 1, sentence 1 says, When Jesus has called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. You know, it's so important that we understand that we have an operator that sends us out. Sends us out to do the will of our God. You have a 911 operator. Brothers and sisters, we need the Holy Spirit. It's shocking to me how little we understand how desperate we are for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There are two properties about the Holy Spirit that we need to really grasp and come to grips with. Number one, the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit of God is powerful. And we don't have time to read this passage, but in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, we see the great prophet Elijah, who has just defeated 950 prophets of Baal with just him and his servant. I tell you, that was not by Elijah's power or Elijah's might. I tell you, that was by the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> Following that, in verse 42, he climbs to the top of Mount Carmel. You see, there had been a there had been a, a famine in the land. There, there had been a drought in the land for three and a half years. And it was time for it to rain. And Elijah climbs to the top, top of Mount Carmel. And the Bible says that he bends over and he puts his head between his legs. He balls up into a tight ball and he prays in the Holy Spirit for rain. Later on in a few chapters later, we find that he becomes the leader and the discipler of Elisha. And there's no doubt that Elijah would see this practice in Elijah. He would see during times of need for the people of God that Elijah would go to his prayer spot. He would put his head between his knees and he would pray and the spirit would work. He 
would be so inspired by this when he would cross the Jordan with Elijah at the end of his life, Elijah would ask him, what can I do for you? And we know the story, Elijah. Elijah asked, Father, give me a double portion of your spirit. I don't know about you, but when's the last time somebody asked you for a one portion of your spirit? You know, I know they want your personality. Maybe they want to preach like you. Maybe they want to teach like you. But when's the last time somebody said, I want a Holy Spirit just like you have? And one Elijah spirit was not enough. He said, I need two. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? Two Holy Spirits? Well, we get a little bit of a glimpse of that here in... 2 Kings in chapter 2, Elijah said, if you are with me when I pass this, you've asked me a difficult thing, but it will be yours. And of course, Elijah was with Elijah when this happened. And then in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible says, the company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. This was a prayer that God answered. It's time for us to start asking for the spirit of Elijah in our lives. And it's amazing, the company of prophets from Jericho, there were 50 in this company of prophets. The Bible says they were watching. Now, I appreciate the company of prophets, but we need to stop watching and start becoming. How many of you are just watching tonight and not becoming a prophet? It's time to take the training wheels off and be the men and women that God is calling us to be. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, 15 through 17, the Bible says that Jesus had the spirit before he was born. But it, then it goes on and it says that Jesus would then preach in the spirit of Elijah. Maybe in heaven, God, the spirit and Jesus discussed this. And maybe they discussed, well, well Jesus, whose spirit do you want? And Jesus said, I want to come in the spirit of Elisha. In Matthew chapter 16, he's asked, who do the people say that I am? You're Jeremiah. You're one of the prophets. Maybe you're Elijah. They got it right. They saw the spirit of Elijah on Jesus. When's the last time somebody asked you for your spirit? That the spirit is so powerful in your life that, that you're a discipler, that, that, that you're... you're People that you're raising up, your young interns have said, can I have a spirit just like you? I suggest to you the spirit is underperforming in our lives when nobody wants your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is intelligent. Turn over to Daniel chapter five. I love this passage. Don't let your salad get in your way. Turn over to Daniel chapter five. In Daniel chapter five, in verse 14, we get a glimpse of what the spirit looks like on a person. He says, I have heard that the spirit of God is in you and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. Anybody that's not joined ICCM, you have no excuse. My Bible says the Holy Spirit can give you insight, intelligence, and outstanding 
wisdom. There's no reasons for any idiotes in the family of God. The spirit is intelligent. It looks intelligent on you. Some of you look so intelligent tonight. You've become intelligent because you've been taught the word of God and you have God's spirit. The spirit of God is a he. Sorry, sisters. It's a he. No gender neutrality with the Holy Spirit. It's a he. John chapter 14, verse 15. The Greek word advocate is translated paraclete. The spirit of God has personality. It reveals, it says in John chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. The spirit gives revelation. It gives guidance for the things that God wants us to do in our lives. How much guidance are you getting from the Holy Spirit tonight? But the spirit can be grieved. The spirit can be grieved, Ephesians chapter four. That word grieved in the Greek there means that it can be made sorrowful as if mourning a death. You know, sometimes you can do so bad spiritually Sometimes you can give so little spiritually that it grieves the spirit and the spirit just feels like somebody's died. The spirit can also be quenched. It can be put out by disobedience to God. The other passage for quenched in the Bible was Mark chapter nine, verse 44, where the Bible says the fires of hell are unquenchable. It's the same word used in 1 Thessalonians. The spirit can be quenched. Point number one. We've got, we've got to behold the spirit's presence. Turn over to Zechariah to our text. Zechariah to our text for tonight. Zechariah chapter 4. We need the help of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. In verse 1, the Bible says, Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up. Anybody need to be woken up tonight? Like someone awakened from a sleep. He asked me, What do you see, Zechariah? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered. Do you not know what they are? No, Lord, I replied. And so he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. God gives in this passage, Zechariah, eight messages through eight visions in one night. The passage we read tonight is the fifth message. Zechariah sees a vision of two olive trees with seven lampstands and a large bowl on top. Verse one lets us know that after the first four visions, Zachariah becomes weary and sleepy. That ever happened to anybody? Anybody ever stay up late with disciples and you're talking to them and your eyes are batting and you're getting sleepy and you look over at them and they're getting sleepy, but you're too prideful to end the conversation and go to bed. He 
has to be awakened from the most important vision in his life. And this can happen to us. How many have needed to be awakened here at the GLC? The truth is, is we must never fall asleep on the mission of God for an evangelized world in our generation. Amen, church? 586 BC, God's temple is devastated and destroyed by the Babylonians. Zerubbabel's grandson, King Jehoiakim, King of Judah, 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 7, we find that Zerubbabel is a direct descendant of the line of David. He's royalty. God has raised him up to be the governor over Judah or to be the mayor or the civic leader and to oversee the building of the, second te of the temple. The Bible here also mentions Joshua the priest, not the Joshua of Moses, but Joshua the priest. And Cyrus in 536 BC reads an edict from the book of Jeremiah, allowing the people of God to go back and rebuild the temple. They go back and they start rebuilding the wall, but then persecution sets in and the building stops for 16 years. And we can relate to this. In fact, we see the same spirit because wherever God is on earth, you can be sure Satan's gonna be there too. And we can see this same spirit in chapter three in the fourth vision. Look in chapter three in verse one. The Bible says, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Can anybody relate to that? The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. You know, Satan uses persecution to stop us. I believe we've had more persecution this year than I've seen in my five years in the movement. But persecution can't stop us. I want us to learn, I want us to learn a battle tactic a model for how to deal with Satan in this passage. Notice in verse two that the Bible says, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebukes you. I don't know about you, but I like this. Because he speaks in the third person. I think there's too much personal communication with Satan in this room. You call it talking to yourself. I call it, you're talking to the devil. We need to understand something. When Satan knocks, let God answer. The Lord said, the Lord rebuke you. We, the, we see this again in Jude chapter 9, in verse 9, Jude verse 9. The archangel Michael is in the presence of Satan and he's arguing about Moses' bones and what we're going to do with Moses' body, which none of us know. That's the first question I want to ask in heaven. Where was Moses buried? But even the archangel Michael didn't speak to Satan in the first person. He said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. In Genesis chapter three, we find someone that didn't put this model of tactical worship with Satan into practice, and that was Eve. We know that Eve talked too much. 
Some of us, we talk too much. God told Eve, don't eat from the tree of good and evil. And Eve told Satan that God said, don't eat from the tree of evil and don't touch it. God never said that. Eve talked too much. Some of us talk too much. And we should never be in conversations with Satan. Scholars believe that the first temptation, the first sin, perhaps was not the biting of the apple. But that the first sin was that Eve touched the fruit and saw that nothing happened. And once she realized and touched the fruit and saw that nothing happened, that encouraged her to think, well, I can eat the fruit and nothing will happen either. How wrong was she? How many times have touching sin caused you to fall into sin? It's too much touching of sin that leads us to falling in to sin. Eve just talked too much. Quit talking to the devil. Set your heart and your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You know, it's interesting because when God came through the garden, they realized that they were naked. I believe this was nothing more than just the absence of light. The absence of light of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Psalms 104 that the righteous are wrapped in light as a garment. Eve never felt naked before, but when the light is removed, you feel exposed. The Bible also says in Psalms 84 verse four, that God is our sun and that God is our shield. In other words, he's our light. It's the only time in the Bible that God is described as the sun, S-U-N. And that God is our radiance and God is our light. And when we sin, that light dims. Talking about persecution. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, I believe the Holy Spirit says it because the Holy Spirit wrote everything in the Bible. Second Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. These words didn't come from men, but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. But Romans chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says, bless those who persecute you. And we see this perfectly in Jesus, right? Jesus blessed his persecutors. I think one of the reasons we're not overcoming our persecutors is because we don't bless them enough. To show you the difference, in the garden, Peter pulls out his sword and he cuts off Jesus' ear. He cuts off the soldier's ear. Jesus says, Satan. After the Lord's Supper, Judas prepares to betray him. Jesus calls him, do what you must do, friend. See, sometimes I think we're blessing the wrong people in our lives. We've got to have a Holy Spirit view of persecution in our lives. Let's go back over to Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 5. Zechariah 4 verse 5, he says, I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. I appreciate Zechariah's honesty. He had never seen anything like this before. This was a template for the new kingdom of God during the time of Jesus. He says, I don't know what it is. 
I appreciate his humility. The great philosopher Socrates was once quoted saying, I know that I know nothing compared to all the things there is to know in the universe. Do you know that you know nothing as a disciple? Ephesians chapter four, verse one through three. The Bible says, be kind to one another, be patient, bear with one another, and be humble. Humility is one of God's most treasured virtues. He treasures it. The Spirit of God, in fact, exalts the humble. James chapter 4, verse 10. Can y'all take a challenge? Y'all don't want to hear the Word of God. How many of you tonight struggle with pride? Raise your hand. I, I want you to look around. I want you to look around. Proverbs, keep your hand up. Don't be prideful. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says that pride comes before destruction. Pride comes before your fall. In fact, the only thing that I can find in scriptures you don't need the Holy Spirit for is to humble yourself, i.e. humble yourself. I believe there's a pride deficit in our movement. This is something we've got to change. I appreciate so much Raul Moreno. I was walking through the lobby last night. I had no intentions of sitting down with he and Ricky and Raul jumped up and ran over and said, can I get you a chair? I'm like, no, 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 I can get my own chair. And he said, no, no, no. And he pushed me out of the way and he grabbed my chair. And I sat down. Why did he do that? Because Raul's a humble man. He wasn't unwilling to serve another brother. I've been getting chairs for people all day today. It's a great feeling. We've got to practice humility. Pride is so destructive to our unity. Pride makes you defensive. Pride steals your ability to be empathetic. You can't feel with other people. You can't feel what they're going through. Pride steals your joy. Pride hinders the bond of peace in the fellowship. When Paul was writing those words in Ephesians, he was writing them from a prison jail cell. He was in chains. And he said, these virtues are the virtues that allow us to have the bond of peace. Back over in Zechariah, there were seven lampstands with seven pipes going into the lampstands. With two olive trees that was bringing oil into the lampstand into the bowl in order to make sure that the light, the lamp would never go out. The lamp is a representation of the Holy Spirit of Zechariah chapter six. It was never to go out. One of the priestly duties was to maintain the lampstand, the menorah, to make sure that the temple constantly had light. They'd have to refill the oil. They'd have to grind the leaves. They'd have to clean the soot out after the lamp had been burning. 
They'd have to trim the wicks to make sure that it was maintained so that the lamp of God would always burn. And this new phenomenon was strange to Zechariah the priest because that wasn't needed anymore. There was a new type of fire that God would establish. You know, it would have been like having solar panels on the top of your car where you would never need gas. Can I get an amen for never needing gas again? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we represent the oil. We represent the light in the new temple of God. You know, oil in scripture symbolizes the Holy Spirit. The oil is your advocate that lubricates. The oil medicates, John chapter 14. The oil illuminates. When it's burned, it becomes a lamp to the world. Revelations 4 verse 5. The oil fumigates. It burns and removes the smell of death and the aroma of death in our lives in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. The oil emancipates. The Holy Spirit emancipates. It sets you free from sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. The law of the Spirit sets you free from the law of sin. It decorates. It gives you a pleasing aroma. It adorns when applied as perfume. Psalm of Psalms 1 verse 3. It coronates, polishes, washes you up, makes you shine as a prince and princess in the kingdom of God. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. You see, brothers and sisters, with the Spirit of God as your advocate, as it medicates, as it illuminates, as it fumigates, as it, as it emancipates, as it decorates, as it coronates, this will keep you from becoming stagnate. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will then be your soulmate. How many of us know what this is? This is the greatest creation since the Holy Spirit. It was actually manufactured right here in Southern California. This is oil in a can. It has over 5,000 uses. It was discovered in 1953 by a group of technicians at the San Diego Rocket and Chemical Company. Google it, over 5,000 uses. This is a miracle. It's perfect for loosening up your cabinet doors the hinges on your door. Just spray a little bit of this on it. it, it it's great for this mic right here. You see? Just loosens it right up. Musicians, it loosens your guitar strings. Midwest farmers, if you spray this on your cow, they will lose all of their flies. It untangles jewelry. Anybody ever have, have their jewelry all tangled? Just spray a little bit of this on it and it'll stretch right out. Where's Jeremiah Clark? You spray this, Jeremiah, on your fish bait, you'll catch every fish. Maybe we need to spray this on some of our Bible studies. The oil, the Holy Spirit, is useful for everything in your life. Point number two, 
First, you got to behold the Spirit. And then secondly, you've got to behold the Holy Spirit's power. We come to our theme passage, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So he said this to me. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. I believe right here we find the Lord's golden rule. His golden rule. He tells Zerubbabel who's faced with this mountain of black charred rubble. Oh, it can be rebuilt, but not by your power, not by your might, but by my Holy Spirit. God says, not the resources of many, not even the resources of one. And we've got to get a conviction about this as disciples. We've got to go after the Holy Spirit like we never have before if we're going to evangelize this world. This doesn't set aside the work that we've got to do, the labor that we've got to do. We better let the grace of God motivate us to work harder than them all. But don't get your security by what you do. Get your security by what's inside of you. Verse six here, family. This verse describes our movement. This verse describes us. July 2003 in Portland. A 49 year old Kip McKean. Tells a brother, we need to set up 25 chairs by faith. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Fills all 25 of those chairs that night. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. There were four campus disciples, one teen disciple, and within three years, the Portland church grew to 489 members, 100 campus students, and 40 teens. The Lord would use this church to send a mission team to Los Angeles. 42 disciples in 2007, May 6th. The LA church is now over 880 disciples. But not only that, the, the LA church is a great spiritual oak tree with many branches. The branch in Chicago that's gone from 131 to 352 disciples in just 30 months. The Chicago branch started with one campus student 30 months ago on one campus to today, 84 campus students on 15 campuses. The branch of the LA church is the Pac World Sector. We started 30 months ago with 424 disciples. I'm happy to announce to you tonight that we're 902 disciples strong. How? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Excitingly, we started with just eight churches in the Pac World Sector. With the three churches this Sunday to Kansas City, Kansas, Iowa City, Iowa, Louisville, Kentucky, the PAC church in the la PAC world sector in the last 30 months will have gone from eight churches to 15 churches. Verse seven of Zechariah chapter four, the Bible says, who are you mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. And then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless. To shouts of God bless it. God bless it. And that's what we want to hear in the kingdom. The shouts 
of joy. God, bless it. Holy Spirit, bless our movement. Who are you, oh mountain? What are the mountains in your life? What are the mountains in your cities? What are the mountains in your church? The Bible says the Holy Spirit wants to level those mountains. Sometimes we get so caught up in the fact that there's a mountain there. If there wasn't a mountain there, there'd be nothing for God to level. I personally like seeing God level things. Not only are we the oil, but we're also the light. We're called to let our light shine. Amen, brothers and sisters? You know, there's a really weird uh, thing in pop culture today called hide the light. And if you look this up in the Webster's Dictionary, the idea is not to tell others about what you're doing or to tell others about your talent or others about your success. High delight means to not tell others about what's going on in your life. I wonder if we've got some high delight disciples here in the audience. John chapter 14, the Bible says in verse 12 in closing, that greater things shall you do when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Greater things shall you do when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You want to do greater things? You want to do greater things? Greater things shall you do when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I can tell you today, I'll give God all the glory for what he's doing in our ministry. But there's nothing in my life that I work harder at than being in step with the Holy Spirit. I spend hours a day striving to be in step with the Holy Spirit. My goal is that the Holy Spirit will come on me, come in me, come through me, come with me, and work for me. We're all about greater things. And we have a greater things Holy Spirit. In closing, in 1957, before many of you were born, including myself, it's one of the greatest World Series in the history of Major League Baseball. We got any Dodger fans here today? Any Angel fans here today? We got any New York Yankee fans here today? In the 1957 World Series, it was the New York Yankees against the Atlanta Braves. The New York Yankees had the greatest winner in the history of Major League Baseball. His name was Yogi Berra. He played 19 seasons as a catcher for the New York Yankees, and 18 of those seasons, he was an all-star. In those 19 seasons, he won 10 World Series championships. He was a legend in his own right. On the other team was a 23-year-old kid just called up from the Negro League by the name of Hank Aaron. He was 20 years old, 23 years old, playing in his first World Series. On April 8th, many years later, 1974, Hank Aaron would break the home run record of Babe Ruth. He would go on to hit 755 home runs. But this was game seven of the World Series for a 23-year-old. Aaron walks up to the plate and he would remark 
in later days in his final interviews that he would often walk up to the plate holding his bat incorrectly. And on this particular at bat in this World Series, he indeed walked up to the plate holding his bat incorrectly with the label facing the pitcher. Yogi Berra, the catcher, the all-star, the legend, said, hey, you're holding your bat incorrectly. Not a word from Aaron. He didn't shift his bat. He didn't move the label to the back of the bat. He just stood there silent. Barrett continued to taunt him, there's no way you're gonna get a hit. And if you hit the ball, you'll hit it on the label and the bat will splatter. What kind of ball player are you? And not a word from Aaron. The pitcher threw the ball right down the middle of the plate. Aaron gazed at the pitch coming in, took a hard swing, hit the ball down into the power lanes of left field. The ball went back and back and back and over the fence and deep into the bleachers for a home run. He dropped his bat right next to the plate, trotted down to first base in glory. He jumped on first base as the crowd cheered. This would have been like having your first Bible study. He rounds first base and he goes to second base. He jumped on second base, the dust leaped off of the bag. This would have been like your baptism to Hank Aaron. He moves around to third base. The crowd is cheering. The fans are jeering. A great crowd of witnesses is exclaiming how great Hank Aaron is. As he rounds third base, he takes the crowd with him. And then he slowly runs to home. He steps on home plate. He looks at Barra and he says with a smirk, I may not hold my bat, I may not hold my bat correctly, but I didn't come up here to read the label. I came up here to hit home runs. The team left the dugout, they picked Aaron up and they carried him off the field as they won the 1957 World Series. You know, today when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is our 911 operator. It's there for us all the time. The Holy Spirit is our oil. It's useful for everything in our lives and in our ministry. It's time to let the Holy Spirit shine. Today it's not enough to just read the Bible. But we've got to come up to the plate. We've got to look at the pitch that Satan throws at us. We've got to face the criticisms. We've got to understand wherever God is on earth, Satan will be there as well to tempt us and cause persecution. And we've got to decide we're not having conversations with Satan. That when Satan knocks, God will answer the door. And we've got to decide in our movement, in our day, a single is not enough. A double is not enough. A triple is not enough. But we've got to hit home runs for Jesus Christ and evangelize this world in our day. And to God be the glory.